I want to pray for us as we begin our fit Bible study back on tonight, as we want to continue to faithfully, intentionally train in the word to build ourselves up to, to in this in this race for his likeness. And we want to continue to pray that as we are in the word, we discover who God is in the word and grow in the knowledge of the king and apply his word to our lives. So let's pray. And then we will jump right into the word. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to be alive. Thank you for your grace, your goodness, your power, your strength, your patience with us. Thank you for forgiving us, God, giving us once again a brand new day to begin to walk with you, Lord, to journey with you, to grow with you, to love with you, to forgive with you, God. It is our desire every day to look like you, act like you, represent you, and for other people to see your grace and your goodness in our life. I pray for those who are online tonight via Zoom and Facebook that you, God, will rush into their heart and into their life. I pray that you will do a work on the inside, God. Do something eternal in us tonight as we engage in your word. I pray for peace in every family and every home. I pray your strength, your, your likeness, your your, your grace, your mercy, your, your goodness to just feel everyone who is listening right now, who is praying with me, God. Allow your Holy Spirit to fill us to fullness until, God, again, we are completely yielded and surrendering to you, that we are walking in the fear of the Lord, respecting you highly, God, respecting your word and journeying with you to a place called maturity, God. We honor you, we bless you, and we thank you for defeating every devil, every demon, God, defeating every curse, defeating every enemy in our life. We thank you because we have victory in you. And so we stand this Wednesday night on the throne of victory, God. We worship from victory. We pray from victory. We live from victory, God. God. We, we walk with joy from victory every day, knowing that the joy that is on the inside of us, God, will help us to endure whatever it is that's standing in front of us so we can continue to get to the other side and live on your level in everything. We bless you, God. We honor you. We praise you. We celebrate you. We magnify your great name, for you are great and greatly to be praised. Now, God, I thank you that your word is working in us and it will continue to shape us and to form us and to correct us and to build us and to break us, God. I thank you that your word is strong and mighty, God. Allow, I thank you, allow right now, God, every single one hearing now to, Lord, receive what you have for us, that we will receive it and we will transmit it from our lives. We bless you, honor you, and give you glory. In your name, Jesus, amen, amen, and amen. Thank God. Come on, let's give him a great, great big hand praise because he is worthy of it. Come on, family, clap those hands and let the sound of praise fill your home, fill wherever you are, fill that place as we applaud our Lord. And as he hears those hand claps and he hears the celebration and he shines upon us. No matter where we are, God, we will give you glory, honor, and praise. Amen. 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 Well, let's jump right into the word tonight. The book of 2 Timothy, chapter number 4, verses 1 through 8. Again, we welcome all of you on Zoom tonight. We welcome those of you who are on Facebook Live with us. And, and again, we ask to go ahead and uh, share on Facebook, share with any friends, because we are serious about our journey with the Lord. And we invite people in to what God is doing in us and what he is doing through us. So let's jump into 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 8. Again, this book of Timothy written two to four years after he wrote the message of 1 Timothy. And he's writing from prison. He is in a dungeon. This is his second imprisonment. Uh, the emperor of Rome is Nero. 
and he has sentenced Paul to die. And so I want you to see Paul in a dungeon, in prison, and not a cushy, comfortable prison. He's in a dungeon, and he is sentenced to die by the emperor Nero. And he is writing this letter to Timothy, as we learn in 1 Timothy, his spiritual son in ministry, who Paul had gathered and invited to join and walk with him. He's writing him this letter to encourage him because Paul knows he's about to die. He's writing this letter to encourage him and to give Timothy strength to continue to journey with the Lord successfully. And I want you and I to receive this uh, chapter four as his very, very last words before he dies, which is significant because if you and I knew that we were about to die, it was our last day on earth and we had the opportunity to write a letter or to share last words with someone, we would really put significant thought to what we are sharing. We will put significant thought to our words. And so I want us to receive this letter by Paul to Timothy. He wants Timothy to come see him before he passes away. And again, he is encouraging Timothy to continue to do the work of the Lord. And these words that he's writing, even Paul is writing them as, wow, these are my last words to my son, in the ministry. So I want us to hear it through that filter. He says in verse number one, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. And we're just going to look at the first six verses tonight. He says in verse number one, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead as his, at his appearing and his kingdom. This, this charge that Paul is writing to Timothy, I want us to, to when we see that word charge, I want you to, to receive that as he's writing it in the sense that Paul is telling Timothy, this moment is very, very serious. And, and, and receive this not only going to Timothy, but let us receive it as coming to you and I, because that's how God intended the word to be for you and I. This, this letter, although written to Timothy years ago, it is speaking to us right now, tonight, right now, where we are. And this, he said, this, in this charge he's giving him, he's saying that Timothy, this moment is very, very serious. Right now, where you are in your journey, in your walk with Christ, this is serious. Where you are, your relationship with the Lord, and what I'm about to share with you, it is very serious. And I repeat these same words to all of you, that where you are now in your walk with Christ, it is very serious. Where you are in your assignment, where you are in your journey with the Lord, it is very, very serious. And, and Paul is telling Timothy, I charge you. I'm serious, he's saying. He's saying, I'm, I'm, the charge is a military command. I, I charge you. I, I, I'm giving you a military command. And what, it, what, is, what he's saying here is Paul is here. I charge you. And he says these words before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is how serious it is. Paul is saying, I'm inviting God, our father and, and his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I'm inviting him in and at this charge, I'm inviting him in this charge and at this charge that I'm giving you right now. So I'm giving you this charge in the presence of the Lord. I'm giving you these instructions, this command in the presence of the Lord. I'm giving this to you in the authority of God. I'm giving it to you coming from God. I want you to receive this as knowing the Lord is right here, that, I, I, that I'm giving you this in his presence, that, that when I'm speaking to you, I'm speaking to you before the presence of the one who gave me the charge, who gave me the word to give to you. That is the height 
of how serious this is. Uh, one commentary uh, wrote that it's as if God is looking over your shoulder and that he is watching you. He is watching to see if you keep this command, this charge, this instruction that I'm about to share. He says, I'm giving this to you in the presence of the Lord. And it is so serious because one day, as it said in that verse, the Lord will judge the living and the dead at his appearance and his kingdom. In other words, he's saying this charge I'm giving you is so serious because there is coming a day when the Lord returns, when the Lord appears that he's going to do what? judge. He's going to make a decision upon the works that you and I have done while we were here on the earth. The work, the assignment that he gave us, he, he's going he's gonna to judge to see how we handled it. What did we do with the work that he has given unto us? And the Bible talks about this in more detail in the book of Corinthians. It says that on that day, uh, some works will be built on, on on wood, hay, and stubble, and some on gold, and some on silver. He says that when our works are judged, some works will 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 endure. They're going to be tested by fire, and some works will endure the fire. And the works that endure the fire. Bible says we'll receive a reward, but he's saying some works are going to be burned up and those works that are going to be burned up by fire, they're going to suffer loss. And I don't want you and I don't want me to suffer any loss when we get home to heaven. Uh, the only suffering loss I want us to have to experience is here on earth. But when we get to heaven, I want us to, to be able to allow the works that we have done here on earth to endure the test of fire. And so that you and I will receive a reward. But one thing is true. All of our works are going to be tested, and, and the ones that are going to endure is those that were built accurately, built on the right foundation, built on that which God has laid before us, built on sound doctrine, built, built not on a sloppy life and a sloppy lifestyle, but built on obedience to the word of God. Those works will endure the test of fire. And so in this one verse, God through Paul is telling Timothy, take this journey serious. Take this charge serious because the day is coming. When I return and I appear, I'm going to judge the quick. Uh, I'm going to judge, excuse me, the dead and the living. I'm going to judge the works of those who will be alive when I return. And those who have died, all works are going to be judged. They're going to, they're going to be put on, uh, on display and they're going to be tested by fire. And what you and I should do with this charge that God is speaking to us, not only to Timothy, but to us, we need to take serious our approach to what we are doing on a daily basis as it pertains to serving the Lord, as it pertains to living our life, as it pertains to relationships and how, how we handle them, how we respond to challenges in life. All that includes our works. Not only my, our, our main assignment is to represent him and to respond to what I'm going through with his word. And that is what is going to be tested. That is what is going to be judged by fire. And again, we should use this charge and approach every single day a little bit more serious about what we're doing, because I don't want my works again, or your works to be burned up. I want us to take serious our journey every single day and know that the Lord, he is, as the verse says, going to appear. He is going to return. And sometimes we, I don't want to say we don't believe he's going to return, but we don't anticipate his return. We don't think about it because we walk around and in our minds, well, you know, they thought he was coming back in the Bible days, you know, and then we went through the 1500, 16, 17, 1800. And so in our minds, we don't walk anticipating the fact that he is going to return one day. But I want us to make sure that, that, that you, you, you change that thought pattern and you and I live with the mindset of knowing He's going to appear. He is coming back. And when he comes back, 
my works are going to be judged. And I, I'd rather prepare and not know when that day is coming than allow that day to come and not be prepared. I, I don't want to be like the five virgins who, who the Bible spoke of. Jesus tells that parable that, you know, there were 10 virgins and five were, were ready to go and five missed the train because in their mind they, they slipped and they, they got distracted. And, and even in them, they, there was something in them that, that maybe felt uh, that train wasn't going to come, that, that, that maybe it would be delayed. But God is never delayed. He's always on time. He is going to appear. He is going to return. And you and I need to take our work serious. We need to take our lifestyle serious. We need to take the assignment he has given to us a bit more serious so that we're ready when that day comes that he appears. And so he says, that he, that again, in verse one, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearance and at his kingdom. Get serious. Then he says in verse two, preach the word. This yeah. is the charge that is given to Timothy, his assignment. Boy, preach the word. Yeah. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. What is he saying here? Paul was telling, when Paul told Timothy to preach the word, what Paul was sharing with him, he was taking it from uh, what, what they had back in that day was rulers who would send out special messengers who were called heralds, H-E-A R L D H E R excuse me H E R A L D they were heralds these special special messengers and a ruler of a kingdom would send out a herald and the herald's role was to go out and to pronounce or to announce the message of the ruler that he had given him to all the people he wanted him to say it loud you say it clear to where everyone could hear you. That was the role and the job of a herald. And when Paul told Timothy to preach the word, he was using the, the, the imagery of that herald that Timothy understood, that my role is to take the word from my ruler, my king, and I am to go to announce what he has given unto me to speak to the people. This herald, he did not go for it to negotiate with the people. His job was to speak the word. Their job was to hear and to heed. Yes. That was it. They were The people were to hear and to heed the word of their ruler. And to not do this, it brought very serious consequences to their life if they did not heed to what the message was that, that the ruler sent the herald to tell them. And that's the role that, God, that Paul was telling Timothy, that our king, our ruler, our master Jesus has given us a word and we are to go and announce and proclaim and make it clear to where all the people can hear. And then it's up to them to take, to hear the word and to heed the word preach the word, yeah. not only had that meaning, but it preached the word. Also, it meant to preach the word. It meant you, 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 you have to, it, it implied that you have to receive the word before you can preach the word. When he said, preach the word, preach the word in order to preach the word, I first have to receive the word, get this, get this, get this, get this in order to speak the word. I first have to receive the word even goes to singing before I, in order to sing the word, I first have to receive the word. So in order to speak it, in order to sing it, in order to teach it, I first have to receive it. That too is in that charge to preach the word. It means that I first have to receive the word before I preach the word. It's, it's for example, it's like uh, the, the mic that I'm using now. In order for this mic to even work, there has to be a receiver. Yes. There has to be a receiver. 
in order for this mic to transmit the sound. And so you and I, I want you to see us as mics. We are God's microphones. We are walking around every day as the microphone of the Lord. And in order for us, for God to, to be able to use us to speak his word, we first, we first have to receive the word. The reason why many are speaking the word, but they are ineffective is because their receiver is not working. The, the receiver is not working, then the mic is not going to be effective. If the receiver is not working, if the receiver is not on, then the mic is not going to be on. It is not going to work. And so when the, in order to preach it, speak it, yeah. sing it, I first have to receive it yeah. because I don't want to be in this and not be effective. I, I can be at home yeah. watching TV, yes. playing checkers or doing whatever we might do. No, I want to make sure that God, when I sing, God, when I teach, if I'm one-on-one -on -one talking to a person, when I stand before the beautiful family you gave me at P4W, I want to make sure the words are effective. And in order for me to be effective, my receiver has to be working. Yeah. My receiver must be on in order for me to transmit, in order for you to speak effectively, to sing effectively, to teach effectively, to share the word effectively. You first have to make sure your receiver is on. The receiver, how does it work? The receiver works when I'm doing the word and not hearing it only. Yes. That's when the receiver works. The receiver only works when you're a doer of the word and not a hearer only. If you don't do the word, the receiver is not on. The receiver is not. In other words, I have to receive. Receiving it means I'm living it. That's what receiving it means. Receiving the word means that I hear what you're saying, God, and I'm applying it to my life. Now my receiver, it is on and it is working. The light is green and everything is a go because I'm hearing and I'm doing. I'm hearing and I'm obeying. I'm hearing and I'm following. Does not mean we're perfect. It means that God, I will not stop fighting to obey your word because part of obeying the word of the Lord is that if we fall, we confess our sins because he is faithful and just to forgive us and we get right back up and what do we do? Go again. Just like we heard last month, the word, one of the word for us this year is again, again, again. And that's what we will do. If you slip, get up and go again. That's part of keeping the word of the Lord. Make sure your receiver is on because it's the receiver that gives the mic the authority in order to work. That's what gives the mic the authority to work is the receiver. No receiver, no authority. So in order to have authority, I have to what? Live this word. Just as the story again, when Jesus walks into the synagogue, begins to teach the word, and they tell Jesus, they, they, the people in the, in the, in the audience and congregation at that particular church, they say, Jesus, you teach as one that has authority and not as the scribes who were teaching every day. What was wrong with the scribes? Their receiver wasn't working. They didn't have their, their receiver. wasn't up. So they were talking, but no lies were changing. There was even a, a demon in the church sitting there comfortably because the scribes did not have authority and they did not have authority because their receiver wasn't working. The receiver wasn't working because they weren't living what they were teaching. Here comes Jesus opens the Bible, teaches with authority. And they begin to say, what new doctrine is this? The, the demon spirit acts up, comes out of the man. Jesus casts him out. And they say, what new doctrine is this? And it was not new doctrine Jesus was teaching. He taught from the same word they, they would teach from every single week. The difference was the living word, the living word, the living word was now teaching the written word. That's the difference. When the written word is being taught by the living word, that's where the authority is. That's where the power is. When what's written is being lived by you, when what's written is being lived by me, that's where the authority comes from. So the receiver it gets his authority, the mic gets its authority from the receiver. And so Paul said, 
preach the word, meaning you first have to receive it in order to preach it. It first has to be received. Preach the word. It also means it, it, it implies that you know the word. In order to preach it, you got to know it. You know the word. Not only do you know the word, you, 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 you teach it effectively, accurately, and you make it understandable to the hearers. And so he says, preach the word. Be ready. What did he tell them? Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Everybody shout, be ready. Be ready. Right where you're sitting, shout, be ready. Be ready. Be ready. What is that word? He said, preach the word. Be ready. Be ready means always, always be at your post. Always be at your post. I, be ready means I need you to have a sense of urgency in you every single day. Be ready. Always be at your posts and have a sense of urgency on the inside. He said, be at your, it, 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 be ready means never be caught off guard. Never be caught off guard. Hear the word of the Lord tonight, family. Never be caught off guard. Let's step our, as we say, let's step our game up. Let's step our faith up. Let's step our seriousness up. Never be caught off guard. Let, let's hold to these words. I know People say you, you should never use always and never, but when they're in the Bible, we're going to use them. When, they, when, when that's, when that's the, the, the definition of a word in the word, that's how we're going to use it, and we're going to stand on it. Always be at your post. Live with a sense of urgency. Never be caught off guard. Never be caught off guard, Timothy, as it pertains to preaching. Yeah. Never be caught off guard, family, as it pertains to sharing the word. Never be caught off guard as it pertains to worship. Never be caught off guard as it pertains to living the word. In other words, at any moment, you ought to be ready to lift those hands and give him worship. No matter what's going on, never be caught off guard. Let a sense of urgency be in you. Stay at your post, worshiper. Stay at your post, living the word. Never be caught off guard in prayer. When someone asks you to pray, you should never say, oh, I'm not ready. Uh, I don't know what to say. No, that's when we were babes. We're not babes in Christ any longer. Most of us. I might have some babes listening, but babe, grow up now. Grow up, grow up, because we want to get to a point where I'm never caught off guard. You ask me to pray, I'm ready. You ask me to share, I'm ready. That's the mindset we have to have. That's the level we have to live on. Remember, we're going after that God level. We have to live on the B ready level where I'm never caught off guard in the area of sacrifice, in the area of giving, in the area of serving. Never be caught off guard. He said this, be ready, be, we ready. He said, be in season, be ready in season and out of season. I want you to be ready. Never get caught off guard. Be ready in season and out of season. Be ready when it's favorable yes. and when it's unfavorable. When it's, when it's convenient to worship and when it's not convenient. Yes. When, when, when they welcome you to preach and when you're not welcome to share. Yes. Be ready. Always be at your post. Keep that urgency. Never be caught off guard. You be ready in season and out of season. Do what you are called to do. That's what you and I have to, where we have to live. Do what you are called to do. Yes. Remember your calling is not subject to your feelings. So you got to be ready in season and out. Your calling is not subject to your feeling. Your calling is subject to your faith. Yes. That's where you're calling. It's not subject to how I feel. Yes. It's subject to what I believe. It is subject to my faith. And we, 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 we live. That means we live at our posts is what that means. Somebody go ahead and put that in the chat. And I got some chatters. Go ahead, type it on Facebook. But what word? We live at our post. Yes. That, that's where we live. Where you live? At my post. That's where I live. I'm, I'm living at my post. I'm not supposed to be caught off guard. I'm living at that place called be ready. We live at our posts. We worship where? At our posts. We give at our posts. We, we praise at our posts. We serve at our posts. We cry at our posts. We get discouraged at our posts. We, we go into pain at our posts. But one thing we do, we never leave our posts. Yes. We never leave our posts. I'll cry here. I'll get discouraged here. I'll get tired at my posts. But you know what? I'm not leaving my posts. I'm, I'm standing right here ready to do what God has called 
me to do. Got to be ready in season and out of season. When I'm when I'm in season, when I'm when I'm in there, when I'm feeling great, yeah. when I'm when I'm high and up on, on on life, and 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 I'm high in the things of God, and 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 I'm I'm doing His will, and everything is clicking and working, and life is in order. You know, I'm gonna give Him my all in season yeah. and then at the same time when when i'm in a low season and 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 when things are falling apart and yeah. and when i'm going through and yeah. when things are not in order in my life yeah. i'm gonna give him my all yeah. in season and out of season yeah. stay at your post stay yeah. at your post stay at your post that's what you and i do we live at our post he said be ready in season out of season and then he tells them to do this timothy Convince, rebuke, and exhort, he tells them. I want you in season, out of season. I don't need you to convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Convince, rebuke, and exhort. He says, not with your own words, but with the word of the Lord. Mm. Convince, rebuke, and exhort. Don't use your words because you'll mess up. And people, that's a lot of flesh in my words. He said, Timothy, use the word of the Lord. Preach the word. Yes. Use the word to convince, yes. to rebuke, and to exhort. Not your own word. The word of God is powerful enough. Yes. Doesn't need additives. <laughs> the word of God is powerful enough. Don't need your own word. Let the word convince, rebuke, and to exhort. He says, you use the word to do that. The word is, the Bible says it, it is, it is alive. It's, it's quick. It's alive. It's, it's, it's more powerful than a two-edged sword. So you just use the word. Let the word do the work. He says, the word convince means to correct those whose doctrine is incorrect. Convince. He says, to rebuke. That means warn those who are in sin. Warn those who are in sin. And then he says, to exhort to encourage those who are on their way to spiritual maturity. So, so the word speaks to all, convince, rebuke, and exhort. In other words, we must afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted at the same time by using what? The word of the Lord. We, 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 what do we do? We afflict the comfortable and we comfort the afflicted. What, what does that mean? Through the word of God, we must not allow people to be comfortable in sin. So we, we preach against it. We teach against it. We sing against it. We, we don't let people be comfortable in sin. At the same time, we comfort those who are being challenged for their faith, who are going through difficulty, who are having a hard time. We, we comfort them. Them, some to bring into the faith. We comfort them. But those in sin, we use the word of God to speak against sin. So we can't leave people comfortable in sin in our congregations, in our choirs, in our in our our, our serving capacities, whether it's a, a usher, a deacon, a porter, whatever it is. Nobody ought to be able to be comfortable in sin in church if the word of God is being preached effectively with the receiver working. Amen. Because again, when Jesus taught in that synagogue, that, that one man that had the demon in him, he, he said, where you come from? Who I know who you are. Mm -hmm. He said, you're Jesus of Nazareth. In other words, he messed up that spirit and couldn't sit comfortable when there's authority. Yeah. And when you and I are walking in authority, singing in authority, standing in authority, Demons cannot be comfortable around us. My best friend should not be an aggressive sinner. Amen. And I might have some friends that sin, but my besties can't be aggressive sin because that spirit should not be comfortable around me. There's certain invitations you and I should not get because of the stand that we take. People ought to know that we are living and walking in holiness. There's certain gossip things that should not come to your phone or, or come to, to, to your, 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 your life or, or your home or wherever you work. Why? Because of the stand you take. People know I'm wasting my time gossiping to this one. I'm wasting my time inviting this one. Why? Because of the stand that they take. Call us what you want to call us. Yes. Call us holy rollers or whatever. But the thing is, 
demons and evil spirits and evil behavior should not be comfortable around us. The only ones we should be comforting again are those we want to strengthen in their walk with Christ or bring into a relationship with Christ. He says, convince, rebuke, and exhort. And he says, how do, you, how do you want me to do this? With all long suffering and teaching, Timothy, that's how you are to do it. And we love that word at P4W, long suffering. Those are two of our favorite words. We love them. He said, with all long suffering and teaching. What, what is long, that word long suffering there, it means with inexhaustible patience. With inexhaustible patience, I want you to to do this preaching of the word in and out of season. With inexhaustible patience. The word inexhaustible, it means unable to be used up because of existing abundance. In other words, I ain't going nowhere. I'm I'm like I'm like that little uh, uh, trick lights, you know that they use at birthday parties, and and you and you think you're blowing out a candle, you know them little little. I think they call them relighting candles or something like that. And you you blow them out, and then they come right back. You blow them out, and they come right back. And before you know, you are, you know you you know somebody playing a trick on you because you blew that thing hard and it went out, but it came right back. Well, that's how you and I should operate. You and I, that's our, our long suffering. You, you, you blow at me and I'm just going to pop right back up. I'm just going to keep coming. My, my light will never just go completely out. Never. Because I have inexhaust, inexhaustible patience. I have an abundance on the inside of me. You have an abundance on the inside of you of patience because of who our source is. He says that we must be long suffering because we will not always see immediate results. So we have to be long suffering. I need you to hang in there. I need you to hang strong because we won't always see immediate results. We do not serve God based upon seeing results. We serve him based upon what we believe. And we have to separate those two. Our reward it's not, it's not in always seeing the outcome and seeing things done. Our reward is doing what he said, not seeing the results. Amen. And in prayer, in prayer, we must be careful not to put our faith in the outcome or in the results. The Bible says to put our faith in God. Amen. That's where our faith comes. Not, that's where our faith goes, not in the outcome. And we do this, he said, with teaching. Says with long suffering and teaching. Teaching refers to Bible doctrine. We must preach and sing doctrine. It's, if it's not biblical, it's not going to change any lives. So the songs we sing and the words we speak, they must be doctrine. Then he said in, in verse three, and I'm going to go quick now because I'm going to get to verse six. So verse three, it says, For the time will come. When they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap for themselves teachers. The word endure, it means to hold oneself up against. The time will come when people will not hold themselves up against the word. They will not want to hear what challenges them to change. And that time, it was then and that time is now. It is right here in our day and time where people do not want to hear sound doctrine. Sound doctrine is accurate teaching, accurately teaching the word. Not, not again, adding my stuff and venturing off in my own thoughts. It's just accurately teaching the word of God. It says the time will come. They will not endure sound doctrine, but have their own desires. Own desires, meaning they want to hear what they want to hear. I want, I, what, what, what I want to hear is that which will allow me to stay in my mess. I want to hear that which will allow me to be comfortable in my mess. That, that's own desires. I don't want sound doctrine. I want, I want to do what I want to do. And, and, and those other individuals that will have itching ears, uh, to have my ears tickled is what that means. Itching ears are one step away from deaf ears, which he speaks about in verse number four. He says, I want you to, they will heap up, they will accumulate, heap up, they will accumulate a list of teachers that will comfort them in their mess. Then in verse four, he says, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Meaning they will turn, again, they will, once they turn their ears from the truth, 
That is one step away from their ears becoming death to the truth. To turn, they will turn to myths and man-made stories, uh, and they will begin to accept that which is unacceptable. And he says in verse 5, but you be watchful, Timothy, in all things. I want you to endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. We're going to stop at this verse right here. We'll pick up on verse 6 next week. He says, Timothy, I want you to be watchful. Be watchful. Be watchful in what? In all things. Be watchful means, again, he's back to that word, be sober, man. Be serious Mm -hmm. about your relationship with the Lord. Be sober and be serious. Stay clear-minded and cool-headed in all things. Quit losing your cool. Quit going off. Quit letting things in this life just make you go off. Quit doing that. Stay stay sober. Be be clear-headed. And, and, and stay cool, stay cool, just, stay, just chill, stay cool. He's telling them, just, just chill out. Some of us, we allow stuff to just make us go off, and we, we, we've grown past that. Just chill now when certain things happen. Keep a clear mind and a cool head, cool head and a clear mind. Just chill. He's telling them. He says, also that word watchful, another commentator, it says, be vigilant against sin. In other words, if something looks like it will lead you to sin, get away from it. If some person looks like they will lead you to sin, get away from them. If some group looks like they will lead you to sin, get away from them. Be vigilant against sin. And we are that way. Why? Because we know sin will take us further than we want to go, keep us longer than we plan to stay, and always cost us more than we plan to give. So we have to be vigilant against sin. He says, Timothy, endure affliction. That word endure, it means I need you to remain in existence when you're going through. I need you to last. I, I need you to, 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 be, to remain in existence. That, that means remain a worshiper, remain a service, a servant of the Lord, uh, re- remain in your prayer warrior spirit. I need you to remain. Don't, don't come unglued and come apart when you're going through affliction. Remain in your holy existence when you're going through. Endure that affliction. Suffer patiently is what he's saying. And you know how we say it. We suffer well. Yeah. We suffer well. We suffer well. Paul was saying, Timothy, you've seen me go through. Now, and you've seen me go through a lot. Now I need you to do the same thing. And again, that's the image that and picture you and I talked about when I share with you to follow me as I follow Christ, that to, it, to imitate my life. You, some of you see me forgive some, some difficult stuff. I need you to do the same thing. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's when you see me go through some hard thing. Yeah. I need you to do the same thing. That, that's what Paul is telling Timothy here. He said, do the work of an evangelist. In other words, you, you, you don't change your calling. You're not an evangelist, but you do the work of an evangelist. You stay in the work of introducing people to Jesus. The evangelist, his job was to keep the message alive. And that's what we must do. Keep the word of God alive. While I'm not an evangelist, I must do the work of an evangelist and continue to introduce people to my Lord, to introduce people to Christ. You don't have to be an evangelist to do the work of an evangelist. And last the last point we wanted to speak on tonight, he told him to fulfill your ministry. He told him, fulfill your ministry. In other words, the word fulfill means leave nothing undone that you are to do. Carry it out fully. And remember, I'm giving you this charge in the presence of the Lord. I'm giving you this charge before God our Father. And he's saying, Timothy, leave nothing undone that the Lord has assigned you to do. And P4W family and our guests and friends, God's word to us right now, leave nothing undone. Leave nothing undone that the Lord has given us to do. I want you to, 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 there's a story in the Old Testament when God told Samuel to tell Saul, I want you to destroy all the Amalekites because of what they've done destroy them all. And, and Saul got this instruction and he went out. The Bible says he destroyed some of the Amalekites, but let King Agag 
and some of the cattle live. And when Samuel returned and Saul runs up to him and he says, hey, Samuel, I've done, this is his word, I've done all the Lord. I kept the command of the Lord. I did what he told me to do. And then Samuel responded and said, well, what's that bleeding of the sheep that I hear? My prayer is that that question will not hang over our heads when we stand before the Lord. And we get before the Lord and say, Lord, I did what you told me to do. And that word hangs over us. Well, what's that bleeding that I hear? In other words, the Bible says that he did not obey the Lord. Because again, partial obedience is complete disobedience. He did not obey the Lord. He did not do what he told him to do. But then I read Genesis 6 and 22. I read that. I re- it re- this passage reminded me of that when I saw this command that, that Paul gave to Timothy. And I read Genesis 6 and 22. And there it says, and Noah did everything exactly as God commanded him. Noah did everything exactly as God commanded him. And when I read that, I prayed for you and I that that will be what is spoken of us. May it be written that we did everything exactly how God commanded us to do it. And I want you to do this for me. Again, I'm just bringing little different ways to, 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 to chat certain things, but I wrote this and I want you to write it too and put it in the chat, put it on Facebook, but I want you to write down, put this down, put G, the letter G 622, the letter G and then 622 and then put a dash and write your name. That, that's what I did. I put G 622 dash Sheridan is what I put because that's what I'm going for. I'm going for that level. I'm going for that place where it will be written of me where I did everything exactly the way God commanded me to do. And again, it doesn't mean we're going to be perfect. We know Noah wasn't perfect. It doesn't mean perfect. It means, God, what you told me to do, I did it exactly the way you commanded me to do it. We are G622 people. That's what we are, G622 believers. We are G622 men and women, G622 husbands and wives and youth and children. We are G622. We're going to do it exact. That's our goal. That is our aim. That is what we are going for, to fulfill our ministry, to do it exactly the way the Lord told us to do it. Father, we bless you and thank you for your living word tonight.